I always like to tell people, there is a recipe that I'll share with you in a minute, but I'd like to tell people to think of ways to keep things simple. If you want to acknowledge the Titanic foods and stories, you can do things like have a cheese assortment that is the same cheese assortment that they had every day for lunch in first class. It was the same one on all the menus that I've seen for lunch. So you could do things like that. For complicated, I would say, uh, I wasn't real thrilled with how my sauce turned out for the salmon on uh, Thursday night. <laughs> Titanic Talk with Nelson Aspen and Alexandra Boyd. Here we feature stories from the independent documentary Ship of Dreams Titanic Movie Diaries and everything else to do with the iconic ship. From James Cameron's epic groundbreaking movie to the history and legacy of Titanic herself. Join us and our special guests as we continue the 25th anniversary celebrations of Titanic. This is your first class ticket to everything aboard the Ship of Dreams. I'm Nelson Aspen and it's our wonderful second season of Titanic Talk and we're going to whet your appetite for all things Titanic tonight because we have a very delicious guest. Don't be fooled when you when you start craving lamb chops in the middle of this uh, of this podcast because if you're watching it on YouTube as opposed to listening to it on the other platforms you will see our guest has a has a crown of delicious lamb chops behind her but you have to go to YouTube to see that Alexandra who is our very special guest tonight our very special guest is journalist speaker author titanic historian and uh, I would hesitate I would <laughs> venture to say chief baker veronica hink who has the most um, i found her because i had to order her book titanic the official cookbook which came to me in the mail last week and i just emailed her straight away and boom here she is veronica welcome welcome to titanic talk thank you so much for coming well thank you both it's so nice to meet with you and i was so excited to hear from you and i'm really looking forward to our talk tonight well, this this book, the new book, Titanic, the official cookbook, 40 timeless recipes for every occasion, is the third of your three books on the Titanic. Uh, and I'm I the last night on the Titanic, I think I read some time ago. Plus, you also have Secrets of the Titanic, the million dollar question for all of us on both sides of the camera when it comes to Titanic talk is what initially fired up your passion for the ship of dreams? Oh, I have been so blessed to be able to tell the stories that I've been accumulating since I was a kid. I have really been researching the Titanic since I was a child. And um, the, the the first book came about, um, there's actually two books that I authored. And then the third book is one that I contributed to. And I, I'm so fortunate to be able to be a part of that project. Um, and I started researching the Titanic when I was a kid and heard about a man who lived in the town where I grew up. I, as a, a real youngster, I was in Merrill, Wisconsin. And then I moved to, to Wausau, Wisconsin, which was just 20 miles away or even less than that. And the man was a third class passenger named Dan Coxon. And Dan was a popcorn vendor and he was traveling in third class aboard the Titanic. And you can imagine, you know, the 1970s when I was living in this much smaller town than it is now, where no one really traveled a whole lot out of outside of uh, town. I marveled at how this man would have been able to get aboard the Titanic, the ship of dream, and would have sailed, you know, from his hometown of London back to um, to central Wisconsin the way he did. And so I, I wanted to learn more. And the more I found out, the more intrigued I became. About a year before the 100th anniversary of the ship, I found out about some bottles of spirits and wines and champagnes that were found at the resting site. And as a food journalist, I really wanted to tell that story. And I was able to tell it through Wine Enthusiast magazine in a real little story that came out around the 100th anniversary and someone saw the story and contacted me to write a book about it 
And I thought, how in the world I even told this publisher who came and, you know, literally asking me to write the book. I was so honored and pleased. And I, I said, I don't know how I would ever do that. How would I extrapolate this into a, <laughs> you know, 200 word story into a 200 page book, right? Well, I, I did it by telling the stories of the people who saved the menus, that the people who wrote the stories about the lunch that they ate. And then we tied in the recipes to create this really beautiful culinary narrative. And that first book features recipes by chefs that have uh, you know interests and ties in the Titanic. And then the, the latest book, which just came out last week, um, there it is, that is my recipes and it celebrates the movie. So it, it reaches out into all kinds of different recipes for movie snacks and it, it uh, acknowledges many of the immigrant stories from the Titanic. There's a, a Syrian recipe, there's a recipe for a pizza, which was only just recently introduced to New York City when the Titanic sailed and of course, the Italian immigrants are still featured while in the movie with um, uh, Jack Dawson's traveling companion. And Fabrizio, Fabrizio. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, well, you what I, what I loved about it is what you've just said is that you didn't just sort of delve into historical recipes via the menu, you sort of expanded it into, okay, we're so intertwined with the movie myself of course notwithstanding and the fans that we speak to and the, the people we've met who just love this story they they will just absorb voraciously any information or anything that you can cast that thread back to back to those those few nights on titanic when when they well, had, when they ate these amazing meals and Titanic aside, Veronica's story, what I love just about you, lead, Titanic leading you to your book from, from that small article is, it, is further evidence that, first of all, you can't create luck. It, you either got it or you don't. Uh, there, there's a, an, a component of luck. It, it helps to be prepared, to be talented, uh, and to be a good worker. But you, you got to have luck. And there, but there's also a lesson for all of us out there that are Titanic enthusiasts. You know, do what you love, pursue what you love, and somehow or another, it will work itself out to become uh, an important major part of your life. So that you know, there are no small, no small stories. Look at look at what it's done for you. And as described, now Alexandra has the book. I don't have it yet, but I've been reading about about the on the website. Uh, it's more than just recipes. You've got trivia. You've got it, this latest one because it's uh, in honor of the film, the 1997 James Cameron film. Stills, uh, pictures from the film. Tell us what's inside, in between those covers. Well, you mentioned the games, and one of the games that I learned about researching for the book is the game of Peter Cottles, and it's a word game. It's almost like Words with Friends today that we play. It's, <laughs> it was sort of the Words with Friends game back in the Edwardian years, and it was um, it came in a little box, and it had words inside and phrases that um, you would work as a team, at different teams working together to create sort of a... Um, uh, improvisation story about this man named Peter Cottles who travels to New York and kind of an, a neat coincidence because the Titanic of course was going to New York and this story was this game is all based on uh, the, a story of you know someone from the country going to New York City which was something that everyone idealized about at that time uh, it was nothing like it is today when you know so many people have the ability to go to New York City you know, it, it, without even thinking much about it these days. But back then, it was just truly a triumph to be able to um, to go to New York City, especially from um, Europe or London or the United Kingdom. So um, that game was very popular, and I really loved learning about it. Um, Old Maid was a popular game back then, Tiddlywinks. And so we talk about that. We also talk about in the book about the um, the customs, calling cards were a necessity. And you know, we've gotten so far away from that calling card uh, tradition now with Instagram and through, you know, we all- Yeah, what's your Instagram you. handle? That's all you need to right. know. I don't exactly. even have business cards anymore. I used to, I, I finally ditched the business cards altogether. Who needs them? 
Yeah, you really don't. Yeah, exactly. And back then you would have to have a, uh, if you were going to have a dinner party in your home, something like, you know, what was aboard the Titanic, you would want to have a card receiver out at your uh, front door went inside in the vestibule and so that people would come in to call they would leave their card for um to identify themselves so um card holders the celery dishes were popular it was very um popular to serve fresh celery in a special dish just for celery back then um you know punch bowls were kind of a thing um you know all the different linens we talk about in the book. Uh, so it's a really nice party guide for- um, Or a hostess parties. gift. If you're or going to a dinner party, that's a perfect gift to take. You you yes. also talk about the Edwardian do's and don'ts, you know, the way a gentleman must never wear his hat, you know, and 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 kissing the back of hands. There was a lot of that going on on set with us. All the all the men immediately turned into Edwardian gentlemen, whether they were actors <laughs> in costume or James Cameron. They would have to reach out for your hand. You'd have to put your hand forward, and they'd kiss the back of your hand. It was like this natural feeling because of this natural want to just become very gentlemanly because we were all dressed in such a stately manner and we also i don't know if you know this but we had an etiquette coach all the time along with us her name was lynn hockney she was actually a ballerina and a dancer and she choreographed the third class dance sequences but she was also with us the whole time to you know doing the the regular work from the outside in on the cutlery you know which i've always thought is sort of a no-brainer just start from the small ones and work up work your way in but they well that's what molly them. told jack they always have to mention that one <laughs> everything like uh, here's here's an example i had um this beautiful little purse with me as part of my outfit and i would sit down i they sat me next to um the captain to burn hill um and we were very swiftly out of the shot but we were passing and so i sat next to to bernard and my purse couldn't go on the table of course it, it i would put it on my lap and i'd forget about it but my silk skirt and this this purse made of tiny little bits of you know chain rail so to speak would slide off my lap and onto the floor and i'm like bernard i'm sorry can you can you pick up my purse again please and i catch lynn's attention i say lynn is there any way i can hide it somewhere on the table so i don't have to keep forgetting about it and keep asking she's like no 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 you have to keep it very politely on your lap but those are the you we had we had somebody who had delved into the history of this etiquette as, as well as you had to to constantly keep us on on track so that we didn't make any edwardian faux pas and you explain it so well, it, you know, so many of the different things that were um, part of the culture back then that you just explained it all so well. And there there are many do's and don'ts. Well, my, my mom mother always <laughs> told us that manners, good manners were a, a tool to help you feel more comfortable and to help others feel more comfortable. It's not just some sort of strange society system. It's actually, it's a tool to help you through life like good manners actually make you a a, a better a better adult i think in some and ways. also at, at table they do i know my mum, who actually has a very sort of working class background she grew up in a council house and you know educated herself educated us she was a stickler for using the right I know Americans eat very differently to us. So we always have the fork <laughs> in the left hand, excuse, uh, fork in the left hand, knife in the right. And you had to hold your knife properly. You could not hold it like a pen. You had to hold, oh my gosh, she had, she had, she would go crazy. Part of her in, you know, and if you think about it, growing up, you know, in the second world war, her parents grew th up through the first world war, this trickle down that if you weren't from, if you weren't from an educated background, the one way you could at least save yourself was at dinner by not eating with the wrong knife and fork in the wrong way. <laughs> And then I came to the States and everyone cut their meat, put their knife down and picked up the meat with their fork in their right hand. And I, I, I was at first quite affronted. I was very young. And now I realize what well, that's the correct way that Americans like to eat in formal dining situations. You know, each culture, each country has their own their own, uh, you know, way of doing things. And as Nelson said, it's kind, you know, as we're alluding to, it's kind of falling out of practice. People, you know, 
people have to learn to eat with chopsticks. That's well, you have to learn how to eat with your phone in one hand and the fork in the other. I mean, it's one of those situations. Veronica, we, we you know, it, very famously in a lot of the Titanic books, we see the menu from the last dinner and there, you know, there are Titanic parties and events where they recreate the menus. But your book, these are these are your creations. Is that correct? These are your recipes that you've created? Yes. They are, every one of them, and I've tested several times. What you see behind me is the, the lamb chops, and this is for, how the book is for, um, like I said, a party guide sort of book where you can um, think of things like past appetizers. This is the kind of lamb that you could ha have in your hand because it's on the bone, a little mm -hmm. piece, um, so it's, they're wonderful to have for your guests to just you know, pick one off a tray, um, put it on your plate with a little bit of, I have pea pesto, spring pea pesto, of course, because the menus were all spring with um, asparagus and lamb and, and so forth. And there's also a recipe for a mint sauce. And uh, it's a bright, pretty green with, because there's food coloring in it. Um, and, and do you have <laughs> replica Titanic White Star Line China? that you serve on when you when you entertain? I do not. I, the pictures that you see are from Inside Editions, from the food stylist and the, who took wonderful photographs. And these are the dishes from the photo shoot. Um, but I, I don't have uh, the replica dishes and I really should get a set of one well, of the We dishes. know a Titaniac. We know a Titaniac. <laughs> I know you just go back through our um our episodes and find Zach Douglas, who has, I believe, at the last count, six place settings of every plate, every knife, fork, spoon, crystal glasses. And I tease the heck out of him because I'm like, I am coming to Australia. We are finding the recipes, Zach. And we are making the food and you invite your friends and I, I will cook because I love to cook. And we, he goes, he goes apoplectic. He starts sweating. And the thought of it, no, no, you'll ne no, well, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I love you to pieces, Alexandra, but I'm not, it's, he, I said, you've got to use, you've got to use those plates and cups and dishes and glasses, please. You know, we asked him to do a little B-roll for the documentary, like, just, can you pour a little bit of wine into that? Pour a little bit of wine into the glass. <laughs> it's that. You got to use it or use lose it. it. Use, yes. use the best china. Use the best china. You must. That's what it's for. But Veronica, well, you I also have Titanic podcast history of, as well. You're, you're, it's, uh, we, we, you go beyond the food uh, into the podcast world. So not just the written word, but the spoken word. We produced a series when the first book came out and it's wonderful and it features all of the different or several of the different topics like um, the doctor uh, who was the, the um, Titanic um, you know stories about the baker um, who was so beautifully depicted Alexandra in the movie the Liam, Charles Jockin. Liam yes <laughs> he did wonderful and so Yes. Well, let's, I think what, what we found is that we've been on other people's Titanic podcasts. They've been on our Titanic podcast. There's this beautiful cross pollination of, uh, and I think it's all sort of grown out of the 25th anniversary of the movie, my movie, which was finished and ready to sell in, in conjunction with our 25 year memory um, of that film coming out and sort of literally making such an impact on so many young people you know a lot of the people that we interview or we've met were so young they were six or 11 or 12 when they first saw this film and just have grown into finding out more about the history whether it's the costumes and the props or the the history of the ship or how many rivets you know the rivet nerds and, and you know we're we're going to have um an explorer who's been down to the wreck we're going to interview parks stevenson so the breadth and the width and the depth of this story seems to be endless. And it's really such a joy for us to, to you know, it's that idea of putting it out there and it, it just all comes back to you. And you are so, I mean, what an amazing blessing for you to have been part of that movie because just it's just legendary. I, 
I rarely watch a movie more than once. And I think I've watched Titanic 20 times. You know, it's just, it's that movie. It's, it just has everything. And Mommy Dearest. I mean, there are just some movies that you can watch (laughs) over and over again. I don't know what it is. Uh, But tell me also, you do live events. Like you take your show on the road and you can do live events. And um, uh, do you, is it like lectures, party planning, consultations? Well, it could, I mean, anything from a cooking demonstration like I um, provided on Thursday, just this week, I made um, some food for a class here in in the town where I live in Wausau, Wisconsin. I made the Welsh rarebit that was on the lunch menu on April 12th that um, Elise Lurette saved her menu and she had crossed out Welsh rarebit. So I had to go down that path and figure out, (laughs) okay, you know, how can we make a Welsh rarebit that Elise would love. <laughs> so um, I made Welsh rarebit and the uh, lamb that you see behind me, the salmon with mousseline sauce. Um, and so I, I demonstrate recipes. Um, we've had all sorts of different parties, like a, a movie party. Um, at one time we did. Um, uh, recently, I had a wonderful gathering in Merrill where Dan Coxon is where he was living when he sailed on, on the Titanic. And the mansion that he had been the caretaker of before he sailed on the Titanic had been raised. And several of the um, fireplace mantles and staircase uh, balustrades and so forth were saved. Some of them were, and they're still at the museum. Oh, so I had a gathering on the anniversary this year where we talked about uh, Dan and um, some of the, the the uh, building had become a convent at one time. So some of the um, sisters who had lived there came back and we all had a reunion. So we've done everything like from that to, um, you know, just different book parties, just getting together to have um, cocktail parties. And um, it, I love that we can get together and um, keep these stories alive through these gatherings. And, and and eat and, and, and drink and have and and have nice full bellies in the process. What's the it, it, what's yeah. um what's the most fun dish for you to make from from your t- Titanic culinary experience? And what's the most tricky one? Like what's the what's the most labor intensive one? And then what's the maybe most fun one or user friendly? Well, the most fun one that I love is the chartreuse jelly with peaches. <laughs> which was dirt and in first class. And it's so pretty. Uh, you can really brighten it up with green food coloring. And it's really a cinch to make. You just use like, you know, your sugar gel and some mint. I love mint. I love the way um, you can bring the flavors out from a fresh ingredient like mint. And then chartreuse, which is really hard to find these days. It's made by... Um, Car- car- do you say Carthusian monks? Car- it's it has so that very distinct color. I mean, the color is chartreuse. It's almost as bright as the green of the peas behind you. Yes, exactly. And then the peach, oh, this, I like to use plain peaches, which you could just buy a can of them. You don't have to do anything fancy with them. And it's just a beautiful presentation in a nice, pretty clear glass goblet with some fresh whipped cream and a nice big plunk of um, fresh mint on top that I love to make that yeah and as far as one there's a really yeah you have to sort of spend all day or or a few days thinking about making it well I try not to do a lot of that Alexandra I I always like to tell people there is a recipe that I'll share with you in a minute but I'd like to tell people to think of ways to keep things simple. If you want to acknowledge the Titanic foods and stories, you can do things like have a cheese assortment that is the same cheese assortment that they had every day for lunch in first class. It was the same one on all the menus that I've seen for lunch. So you could do things like that. For complicated, I would say, uh, I wasn't real thrilled with how my sauce turned out for the salmon on. Uh, Thursday night, <laughs> it separated. Is that the mousseline? Is that what you? Is yes, that what it was called? Yes. Yeah. And the mousseline sauce is like hollandaise sauce, but there's a difference. It's the, basically the same as hollandaise sauce, only with whipped cream, fresh whipped cream. 
folded in. Okay, mixed oh, in. No, that's that's too, way too many variables for me. Yep. I, and I'd you be have to separate them. eggs. Yeah. And, yeah, I can barely so that... fold a shirt, let alone folding it into a <laughs> recipe. <laughs> yeah, so I would say after Thursday night's experience, I would probably not want to do that again anytime too soon. One thing, um, uh, this is something that you might enjoy a story, um, you know, Titanic won all the Oscars and, and a bunch of us who played these supporting roles all sort of became in our own social circles. And um, it, somebody got wind of the fact that the Culinary Institute of America in the Valley was going to use the last menu on the Titanic as their graduation show. And um, and I was like, oh, we've got to get tickets for that, you know, yeah. uh, all, all the men put on tuxedos all the ladies found you know we found ball gowns we we didn't have our costumes of course but we we doled ourselves up as 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 well as we could and rented limousines and we did actually get to eat and of course they were tiny lots of tiny small plates so by the time you uh, you'd finished you were very full but um each plate came out and was presented it was re and somebody announced you know the history of the food of it and everything so that was really a, a lovely way for us to keep celebrating the fact that we'd been in this this spectacular film that so unexpectedly had been such a huge hit i hope you finished off the evening with the leonardo di cappuccino <laughs> <laughs> I'll say yes, we did. Yes, of course we did. <laughs> and so, we didn't uh, count. You see? Now nah, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. Now I Alexandra has the book in her hands. Um if you flip through and maybe show us one of the stills from the from the film. Um yeah, so Veronica, when you were, were art directing the book, what went into the decisions and choosing of the photographs? Did you interact with James Cameron at all in the in the in the building of the book? Uh, my my contributions were the recipes, and I did take photos of what I made. Um, and the beautiful work that you see there in that book is the it was the direction of Inside Editions. And I, I'm so impressed. Isn't that nice? Lovely. And do you, do you see any scenes in there that you recognize, Alexandra, from that you were involved in? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm flicking now because like these cocktails and everything. Look at the cocktails. Yeah. It's fantastic. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Well, this here, this is, that's a very um, uh, interesting shot of, of Jack and Rose um, uh, about to go into first class dining room. And the, the staircase below that is the staircase I walked up and down for 18 hours. They had like a three story <laughs> replica of, you know, the, the top, that layer there where they are. And then down below that is where you'd walk into first class. And I did, I trod those boards. I trod those treads for 18 hours for day one. In a corset. In a corset. <laughs> wow. well, but it must have been very difficult for the ladies and they're all strapped into their corsets the way they were. How did um, they eat so much? I, I like, you know, we're used to, after COVID, we're used to eating in sweatpants all the time. Everything has an elastic band. So uh, the ladies in those days, especially with the, the requisite etiquette involved, let alone the corsets, it must have been difficult to get a lot of food down. Well, I think that that's probably, you know, it definitely was motivation to, when you think of the corsets and the, the the work to get into them. And I know that one of the things I learned in my research is that Molly Brown was actually a, a very petite uh, woman. And I don't think she's depicted that way necessarily. And she was always working out and exercising and um, she, you know, walked. She was a frontier woman. On the Titanic. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, she was actually what I would call tiny. Um, so I, I know we think of these people that sat and ate, had these phenomenal meals, but <laughs> um, they also took care of themselves. You know, they 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 really weren't much different than we are today. Is the portion size? I also mm -hmm. heard that a lot of ladies would eat before dinner, and then nibble and push their food around their plates to make it look like they were dainty eaters and dainty gentlewomen. So I wonder if anybody used the gymnasium on the Titanic other than the trainer. Did. But you, know, you, you speak about Molly Brown and I remember the remember the version of Titanic with Barbara Stanwyck and Clifton Webb. 
Um, they had a Molly Brown character, but it was they didn't call her Molly Brown that uh, Thelma Ritter played. I think they called her Maud, but it was the character. But it was it was really, in essence, the Molly Brown character who got out there and was rowing and was, you know, playing cards with the men. Uh, and I was thinking about that when you mentioned the 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 word game that they played on the Titanic, because in the films, I think uh, in James Cameron's Titanic, we saw a kid playing with a top. We saw the kid playing with the top on the on the deck. That's a reference to the Father the Brown photograph. images. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And we, we've seen cards, and I think there was a, a game with they were playing dominoes or something in one film version. But uh, but that's re that's really interesting. I love the word game. I'm I'm keen to find out more about that. That also sounds like I'm a I'm a word game aficionado. And, so that sounds... and just like cruise lines today, or when people go on cruises, you had to find ways to pass the time. There had to be entertainment right. and some description. So these these parlor games, I'm sure everybody, and of course, poker. Leo, once he'd learned to play poker for his winning the ticket scene, he would bring cards to the Real Del Mar where we'd all you know, be drinking our famous, famously drinking our margaritas. And he wanted, he wanted to keep playing poker, but we all wanted to sing traditional folk songs. So he didn't get, I think he had one or two takers, but mostly he, we were, we were singing songs with Brian who, Brian who played the, the pipes in uh, Gaelic Storm. You're going to want to, Veronica, after this conversation, you're going to want to go back and rewatch uh, James Cameron's Titanic again. Just, I mean, I always feel that way after we we speak to one of our guests. Uh, it's like, oh, you know, there's there's something, there's always something new to notice or analyze or think about. And that leads me to a question for you, Alexandra. When, because you were in that dinner party scene um, for however many days it took to shoot all of that, did you at any point get to eat? And if so, what yes. what did they serve you to yes. to stand in for? We did. Yes, we did. Um, they had, they brought around um, uh, uh, pâté de foie gras, which was on a little plate and it had a tiny little piece of sort of um, uh, garnish on it or something. And um, I remember them sort of taking it away because they had to serve it again and taking it away and serving it again. So well, you got- By the end of the day, that wouldn't yeah, have been so they good. They all had a sort of thin <laughs> film of dust over them because they had been sort of sitting off to the side in the props area. That was, that was pretty obvious. I looked at the menu sitting in front of me on the table and in that beautiful menu holder, which I still want one so badly, this, the star shaped clip with the, the menu sat in. Oh my gosh, if that fit in my long glove, that would be <laughs> on my desk right now, but it wouldn't. Um, and and we, yes, we did. We ate, we ate pate de foie gras uh, very daintily and sort of very um, pretendingly. Sparingly, I would <laughs> think, yes. <laughs> Veronica, what's next? What's the next thing on your on your to-do list? Well, right now, I'm just having a really wonderful time sharing these stories as this book just came out. And um, of course, the my first book just came out in paperback in the spring. So Fantastic. working on a lot of really great things like this talk tonight. And then I have um, I have two books coming out next year that I, I can't really tell a whole lot of detail about yet, but I can tell you that they are culinary history culinary uh based and um and they're they're going to be very interesting and i'm having a lot of fun putting the finishing touches on them and third checking double checking recipes and making sure everything works together so i have had so much fun talking to you i am going to make the net the first recipe i'm going to make <laughs> is Eaton Mess because I love, I love me and Eaton Mess. It's very English and it makes me think of English summer times. Cause the last I one- I want a cocktail. I, you stick with the food, I'll stick with the beverage. For well, you. the last one I tried to make was a disaster. The meringue was like a flat brown cow pat when it came out. I'm, I've never been so embarrassed by a meringue in my life because I've never had a problem with before, but they, they're just the-, the Words I have never uttered. <laughs> The, the meringue gods were against me that day. So with your, I'm going to go for the proper recipe this time and use use it from your book. And the next oh, time we're in God. Wisconsin, we expect a dinner uh, invitation. Or we all have to go to Australia and make Zach. And eat on Zach's plates. <laughs> well, Veronica, as you said earlier in the episode, everybody's dream was to get on the ship and go to New York City. Well, that's where I am. So you let me know next time you're in New York City and uh, I won't make you cook. I'll, I'll buy you dinner. Thank you so uh, much. <laughs> well, we'll all get on your website, check out your book. 
If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a review. And if you'd like to hear more podcasts like this, hit the subscribe button. For information on where you can see Ship of Dreams, Titanic Movie Diaries, go to shipofdreamsfilm.com. Titanic Talk is a production of Ship of Dreams Film Limited. To celebrate Season 2 of Titanic Talk, we've launched a line of Titanic Talk merch. A cap, a mug, a tote, a t-shirt or a hoodie? You'll be sure to find a unique gift for the Titaniac in your life. Look for the link in the notes and on Instagram or go to bit.ly forward slash Titanic Talk shop.